4 a.m., Sunday, 12th November. RAF Lancasters take off on a 1,200-mile flight to Norway. 29 of the four-motored craft head for Tromsoy Fjord, where the Tirpitz, last of Germany's big battleships, had eluded two recent attacks. The first, on 15th September, was unsuccessful owing to an amazing smoke screen created by thousands of smoke pots. These pictures, taken from a reconnaissance plane at 13,000 feet, show how effectively the Tirpitz was concealed. No hits were scored by the RAF on this run. In these British films, the Tirpitz is seen firing her 15-inch guns as the second attack was attempted on 29th October. Again, the smoke screen. This time, combined with bad weather, made bullseye bombing a hazardous venture. However, the RAF managed to score one hit with a 12,000-pounder. As long as the Tirpitz remained afloat, she was a potential threat to the Russian convoy route, tying up strong forces of British warships in northern waters. She had to be sunk, and on 12th November, the Germans finally are caught by surprise. There is no smoke screen, and direct hits are scored. Flying between 13,000 and 16,000 feet, each of the 29 Lancasters loses a six-ton earthquake bomb. The German battleship is hit at her bow, amidships, and toward the stern. This action was photographed simultaneously by two RAF camera planes. Her guns are silenced, and the Tirpitz is again covered by smoke this time from flames that seal her doom. Officially listed as 35,000 tons, she's believed to have been closer to 45,000. The warship heels over into the shallow fjord. The Tirpitz carried 1,600 men. When the Germans finally broke their silence about the ship, they claimed that a large part of the crew had been saved. Structural steel for all six Allied armies is made available as the Army sets up its own production 17 miles from frontline activity on the Moselle River. The management of the big plant at Dieferdange, Luxembourg, had been requested to operate blast furnaces, Bessemer converters, and the mill for rolling steel beams on an eight-hour-per-day basis. Iron ore from surrounding mountains is mixed with coke and limestone imported from Belgium. The output of the hot air steel work since the Allies took over has been chiefly heavy steel I and H beams for bridging water barriers before the Reich. Localized overseas production of vital engineering replacements obviously alleviates strain on the services of supply. On a normal crossing, a single Liberty ship can carry approximately the same tonnage as is turned out by the Luxembourg mill in a two-week period. To haul this amount of heavy steel beams from docking points to the front lines would require 250 railroad flat cars. Force film surveying damage to Belgian rail centers accomplished prior to 6th June. On the night of 1st, 2nd May alone, these marshalling yards at Marlene were struck with 510 tons of explosives by a bomber command force of 115 Alifaxes and Lancasters. Marlene is on the main line between Antwerp and Brussels and is also an important junction on the Ghent-Liège branch, running westward from the industrial Rhineland. Hasselt, key point on the northern route from Cologne-Aachen to Liège-Brussels-Paris. 
bombing by the heavies of the RAF, and rocket bombing and strafing by Mustangs and Thunderbolts of the U.S. 9th Air Force helped pulverize these yards and shops. Hasselt is also the center of the Compine coal fields. Coutre in West Flanders. Here near the French border, three lines from Ghent, Ostend, and Brussels converge for Lille and Paris. On the night of 10th, 11th May, RAF heavy bombers unloaded 510 tons of bombs on the yards, repair shops, and warehouses located here. Ten nights later, a flight of seven mosquito bombers struck again. With each light bomber carrying one 2,000-pound bomb, the mosquitoes pinpointed key installations which had been repaired hurriedly by the Nazis. Heavy damage to marshalling yards and rolling stock at Louvain, where two north-south and one east-west railroad lines meet. The RAF struck here with such telling effect that on 19th May alone, three Spitfires knocked out a train of 50 to 60 cars loaded with tanks. The Panzers were prevented from reinforcing Rommel's units deployed in support of the West Wall. Destruction of key points in the Belgian network of 6,800 miles of track complicated the supply and transport problems faced by the Nazis in France and in the lowlands. On 10th November, General Dwight D. Eisenhower rounds out an inspection tour of Allied units preparing for the mid-month general offensive against the Reich. The Supreme Allied Commander visited positions in France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. Jeeps are left behind as General Eisenhower leads his party up a muddy hill to the command post of Major General Charles H. Gerhardt's 29th Infantry Division. At a review, General Ike chats with doughboys fresh from the front lines. The day before, at Brussels, he had told the Belgian parliament, we are fighting an enemy who understands only one thing, force, and we intend to apply force to the utmost. Blood conditions caused by torrential rains along a sector of the Western Allied battle line. This waterlogged highway is a main supply route and one of many roads along the 3rd and 7th Army fronts affected by late fall rains. It's the time of the great drives for Metz and Strasbourg. The flooded Moselle River inundates the countryside at Cavis on the 3rd Army front, submerging planes used to fly blood plasma and medical supplies to forward areas. The stream rose overnight, expanding its width from 50 to 1,500 yards. It's not known if the sudden rise was due to the heavy rainfall or demolition of a dam upstream. Aiming for a bridgehead across the Moselle, elements of the 90th Division prepared to negotiate the stream in assault boats. This ferry service was devised pending construction of a bridge by the engineers. A ramp is constructed to bridge an area between high ground and the assault boats. According to engineers, the river is 54 inches deep, just a little too much for jeeps, trucks, or tanks to try to ford. Efforts to provide a suitable span across the swollen river were met by enemy artillery fire. The ferry service gets underway. Every inch of the crossing carrying a threat from floating mines and from Nazi artillery on the opposite bank. Heavy rainfall along another sector of the American advance delays the progress of line straightening operations. 48 hours of rain bogs down tanks which were being used as artillery. Time accident at Le Rouge O. Hitting a soft shoulder, a wrecker belonging to a tank battalion turned over into an irrigation ditch, carrying with it a two and a half ton truck. Despite rain and mud, 
Allied forces are moving forward on the offensive along the larger part of the 450-mile front. As the earliest and harshest winter in 80 years comes to northern Europe, snow camouflages the terrain from the Dutch lowlands to the icy passes of the Vosges. Here, awaiting the mid-November general offensive, gunners of a French division cooperating with the 7th Army stand guard at their emplacements. The morning of 9th November, at a command post area on the 1st Army front in Belgium. Further east on the Belgian line, snow covers machine gun positions near the village of Kringkelt. Infantrymen line up for noon chow, as a snow-covered vehicle serves as a dining table. Near Bastogne, in the same sector, men of a signal company splice telephone wire. Plowing of the slippery road continues as the snow turns to slush. Telephone wire on the ground is uncovered and strung aloft. As the line is stretched from pole to pole, slack is picked up and less wire is required. Miracles of supply by the quartermaster corps have given the doughboy in the line the type of personal equipment needed to take on another enemy who is no pushover, General Winter. <laughs> Driving rains and flooded roads slow down the 5th Army advance toward the Bologna Rimini Highway. On 2nd November in the town of Borgo San Lorenzo, the flood reaches a height which causes all military traffic servicing one forward area to come to a virtual standstill. Facing Allied forces along the whole Italian front are 28 Nazi divisions who, despite their heavy casualties, continue to make the conquest of the Po Valley a costly operation. Roads in the 78th Division sector of the Gothic Line are reduced to quagmires posing a constant transportation problem. Commenting on the difficulties encountered in the crawling Allied offensive, General Sir Harold R. L. G. Alexander, Allied commander in the Mediterranean theater, acknowledged that the Italian campaign was stalemated. He declared, however, that the offensive would continue until the last Germans were cleared out of Italy. Acceleration of post monsoon operations in North Burma, added animal transport is rushed into the jungle battlefields. A field artillery battalion receives fresh teams of mules newly arrived from the States. This shipment consists of six sections, with 190 mules to the section. They are en route to Mogong, and the trip involves a ferrying job. Although they are tied to the ferry, several of the mules manage to fall into the water. Crossing the Mogong River from Kamang, which is on the new stretch of the Lido Road between Wallabum and Mogong. Starting at the mogong michinar road junctions, the Allies have been moving further southward in the campaign to re-establish land communications between India and China. The unpredictable terrain encountered on these drives makes the employment of mules most advantageous. Supplies flown in from India would often be stranded far from the battle lines were it not for mule pack transport. Trains haul the mules over the last miles of their journey to the front. Leaving Mogong for the interior on 31st October.
At Ching Weong, Burma, timber for bridges and causeways is provided from abundant forests. 90% of the wood is halong and makai, reputedly among the finest timber in the world. The lumbering operations are carried out by the engineers. Chokers are hooked to the logs, and a tractor with logging winch will skid them to the cutting machines. bucking or cutting the logs to the desired length. Loading the cut sections for transportation to the mill. The plant at Xing Buyang and another at Ting Kok Sakan have produced five and a half million feet of lumber in less than 10 months. The biggest output for a single day has been 43,000 feet, three times the normal capacity of this mill. A 60 inch circular saw powered by a 90 horsepower motor is employed. In addition to bridge construction, the demands for lumber also come from Lido Road engineers. For instance, washed out terrain made it necessary at one point to construct a two mile board road elevated on piling. Therefore, this localized production of vital timber greatly expedites the increasingly necessary road to blockaded China.